So we'll basically be doing a review of the waves module, apart from the part of thermodynamics. And the first important thing we need to understand is what is a wave? And that's actually a very, very simple thing to answer. It's basically a result or a propagation um, of energy. So it carries energy from one location to another. without the movement of matter. And it's always a result of a energy disturbance. So something happened and then you will result in a wave being formed. And this wave would then essentially sort of move throughout and sort of go throughout space. And that's basically what a wave is. Yeah. Now, we classify waves in all sorts of ways. So the most common way is to basically talk about whether it's mechanical or not. So wave classification. One common way to sort of classify is to classify as the mechanical wave versus an electromagnetic wave. Now, if we're not going to be too, you know, going too much into the details of the definitions and specifics then for now, then basically a mechanical wave will need a medium to traverse. Needs to go through a medium to be able to propagate and therefore cannot propagate through a vacuum. Whereas an electromagnetic wave does not require a medium. Now, mechanical waves are basically things that kind of move through some sort of medium. So, you, you know, all of your examples would be things like, you know, water waves, earthquakes, earthquake waves. So that's your P, Q, um, S waves, sound waves, and so on. Your electromagnetic waves would be your electromagnetic spectrum, of course. So that would be all sorts of things like your ultraviolet, your infrared, your light, your x-rays, your radio, your microwave, your gamma rays. Not in that order. But a mechanical wave must pass through a medium and therefore its velocity may depend on that medium. And the mechanical waves go through a medium through essentially the collision of particles. So one particle hits the next one and causing it to move. Whereas electromagnetic waves are fundamentally different. While the velocity still depends on the medium, the electromagnetic wave is a result of electric and magnetic field oscillating. And so there's no collision of particles. It is simply the oscillation of these waves forward and backwards. And as a result of that, you know, that results in a speed that is constant in that medium. For vacuum, that's equal to C, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So your wave classification, we've broadly kind of described what's the difference between a mechanical wave and an electromagnetic, but you can classify it based on, I suppose, the type of wave. Um, so we said mechanical versus electromagnetic wave. 
you can base on the sort of type based on its sort of propagation and time. So if it's a propagating continuous wave, otherwise known as traveling wave, which is often the type we're talking about, or are we talking about a sort of pulse so it doesn't keep going forever? Or are we talking about a standing wave? Right? One that is a result of an interference pattern as we've studied. And the other is based on the oscillation of the particles. So this is where you classify them as either transverse or longitudinal. And a transverse wave is where the particle direction is going to be perpendicular to the wave velocity. And the longitudinal is where the particle oscillation is parallel to the wave velocity. Yeah. So let's take a look about at diagrams representing sort of transverse and longitudinal waves. So here is our transverse wave. Now a transverse wave is where, as we've said before, the wave oscillation is perpendicular to the wave velocity. And so if we say that the wave is going to the right, that means this black wave will then be moving to the right very shortly. So it will very shortly be in the position where it is in the blue area. So everything just gets moved to the right. But remember, the wave moved, but the medium doesn't really move. So just like, you know, a wave might go towards the shore, but the water doesn't really usually kind of go from the ocean to the shore, not, not in total, right? So, or if you, you know, if you have A and B moving a rope up and down, the wave moves to the right, but the rope doesn't just go to the right. That's yeah. what we mean by there's no sort of movement of matter. And so, you have to think of essentially how the wave sort of moved. And if you start from where the black is, but you don't get to move towards the right, then essentially for a transverse wave, these particles are moving up and down to achieve this effect. And so you can see that the particle is moving up or down. The oscillating up or down, but the wave is moving to the right. And because of this perpendicular relationship, that's why it's called a transverse wave. Now that's quite different to a longitudinal wave, which is much more difficult to draw, but we will try. So a longitudinal wave, the velocity is still going to the right. But what actually ends up happening is that these waves vibrate like so, which means that your particles are vibrating left, right, and no longer up, down. Your wave is still going to the right. And as a result of that, because the relationship between these is parallel, then this is called a longitudinal wave. Yeah. So here, you can hear C number one is a transverse wave because in number one, you can see that if we look focus on a particular particle like this one, it is going up and then down to as the wave goes to the right, 
the particle is moving up and down to make that happen. So yeah. that's why one is transverse and number two is longitudinal. So you can see, you can probably see this sort of wave that's kind of passing to the right. And perhaps it might be more clear if I speed it up a little. Yeah. And, but basically, if you take a look, you can essentially kind of see a sort of wave pattern going to the right. And if we were to sort of change this a bit, perhaps that would make it even more obvious, right? You can see this sort of wave going to the right. But if we were to look at a particular particle's position, you can see it's moving left, right to make that happen, to achieve that. Oh, yeah. And as a result, this is going to be the wave is going to the left, right, and the particle is going left, right. And that is therefore your longitudinal wave. Now, if we have this diagram of a wave, then what we also have then is the ability to kind of recognize and label certain parts. So remember, this is called a crest at the top, and this is called a trough for a longitudinal wave. Now, the distance from a crest to a crest is called a wavelength, and given the term lambda, measured in meters. Your longitudinal waves have something similar but it's kind of given different names. So this is what's called a, well, rara fraction. And this here is what's called a compression. Yep. So a compression is kind of like a crest, but it's like a high pressure region, but we never call them crests really. And this is a low pressure region. All right. Yeah. So those are how what you might see from a graph of the wave. Okay. But you could also graph a wave against time. So if we're trying to graph a particle against time, ooh, we, we missed out saying something, by the way. We also have the amplitude. So this here is the amplitude. So if we're gra graphing a particle displacement against time, we can still read off the amplitude. But the important thing to recognize is that this here is no longer the wavelength. This here is now a difference in time and that's called T, which is period. So the key things you need to know for about a wave are, well, A is amplitude measured in meters, which diagrammatically is basically the, the highest displacement, the furthest a particle moves from its equilibrium position. You have the wavelength, which also is measured in meters, which is basically the distances between two crests or any two points in phase. You've got your T, which is a period, which is basically the number of seconds or time taken for one wave to pass. You also have what's called frequency, which is the number of waves passing in one second. And as a result of that, you can quite clearly see that T equals one over F and F equals one over T. And you also have what's called the wave number. And the wave number is basically the number of waves in a set distance. <clears throat> okay. And so the wave number K 
is simply equal to 2 pi over lambda. So as a result, we actually have quite a few, no, I mean, not that many, but understanding what all those are, we have what's called the wave equation, which is V equals F lambda. So the velocity of a wave equals the frequency times the wavelength. The frequency is the reciprocal of period. And of course, the vice versa is also true. And we have K equal to pi over lambda. Yep. So the next thing we are basically considering is, well, how do waves behave? And we've said that waves basically undergo all sorts of different sort of phenomena, including reflection, refraction, diffraction, and what's also called superposition, which would lead to the diffusions. There are other things like polarization and so on that you probably don't need to worry about right now, but it could be a good useful precursor to year 12. But let's focus for now on reflection, refraction, diffraction, and interference. So reflection is quite simply governed by the law of reflection, or the, it follows the law of reflection, we should say, which means the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And that's basically a situation where, okay, you've got a surface, you've got a light ray coming in at some angle. We will construct a line that's perpendicular to the surface and we will call that normal. And so this is your surface. The angle between the normal and the incident light ray, this is theta, or we'll label it I. This is the angle of incidence. We are always measuring between from the normal. And so we would instead, in this case, get an angle that is equal to that. So something like that. And we will call this angle R. And we will call this the angle of reflection. And for reflection, I must equal R. So this angle must equal this angle, and that's reflection. And the sort of things reflect, or well, things like mirrors. So reflection is simply when you've got a light ray coming in, it bounces back, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, I equals R. And that's your reflection. And of course, later on, we'll be looking at ray diagrams and how they bounce off surfaces that are flat. But that's essentially reflection. Now, you've also got refraction. So refraction is essentially, you can think of it as a bending of the wave when it changes medium. And this is a result of the change in velocity. So when it comes to refraction, you will have a medium one and medium two. You will have an incoming wave, for example, light. It doesn't have to be light. Um, let me do it like this. So I've got an incoming light ray. As usual, we draw a normal, which is perpendicular. The thing in between is basically your interface or boundary or interface. And that's between your medium one and medium two. Now it does depend on what basically happens, but basically medium one will have a velocity, V velocity of V one, 
and medium two will have a velocity of v2. And if we have a situation where v1 is greater than v2, then you'll notice that this will happen. And we would actually define as before, this to be I, and this is still the angle of incidence. And we'd still define this to be R, but quite clearly the way I've drawn it, I is not equal to R. In fact, in this case, I is greater than R. And this is now called the angle of refraction. Now to be clear, refraction and reflection we're considering to be different things. We're not saying that the light doesn't reflect. There will still be some reflected light that we're ignoring in our diagram. So there'll be some reflected light. So the light that's reflected kind of goes in that direction, which I'll rub off in a moment. But some light will be reflected and some light will be refracted. And how much gets reflected, how much gets refracted, just depends on your material. All right? Yeah. But we'll ignore the reflected light for now. Okay. So it really depends on your velocity. If it's V1 versus V2, if V1 is greater than V2, then this sort of happens. Of course, it could go the other way. So just drawing a very similar thing over here. On the other hand, if it still came in like this, but you know, V1 was smaller than V2, then it would do that. So this is I and this is R. Everything is else is this basically the same, so I won't rewrite it out, except in this situation, well, because of the fact that V1 is smaller than V2, we end up with a situation where I is less than R. And this, you know, has to do with the analogies of wave fronts and things that we've sort of talked about before, and you can go back and look over those notes. But the key thing you sort of need to understand from here is that refraction results in the spending of the wave. And that is governed by Snell's law, which basically states that sine of I over sine of R equals, well, V1 over V2, which is equal to lambda 1 over lambda 2, which is equal to N2 over N1. Now, I and R are probably quite clear, but we'll write it out to be perfectly clear. I is the angle of incidence. R is the angle of refraction. B, one or two is the velocity in medium one or two. Lambda is the wavelength. N is the refractive index. Now, is frequency in this formula? No. Does frequency change as it changes medium? Um, no. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Note, frequency does not change. Uh, if you have questions about why that might be the case, you might look over and think about where a wave comes from and how it's generated. But we've talked about this before. And basically, even though the wave might move slower, the frequency at which it is you know, perceived does not actually change um, when you change medium. It might change due to other effects, such as the Doppler effect that we might talk about later, but not, not as a result of refraction. Good. All right. So next is diffraction. Now, we'll do a lot more in year 12 on diffraction as well, and it is a quite an important phenomenon. But diffraction is basically the spreading out of waves. It is essentially spreading out of waves into space after passing through a gap or around an obstacle. So generally speaking, for significant diffraction, we need the wavelength to be similar to the opening size. So 
it just changes basically you're spreading out the energy but note that there's no change to the velocity of the wave well the magnitude of the velocity of the wave the direction could change but the overall direction doesn't change i suppose but it spreads out more um so there's no change to the speed probably a better word here there's no change to the speed or the wavelength or the frequency it's kind of just kind of going out into space it's kind of just diluting itself so essentially that will be the situation where if you've got a wave that passes through here so if this is your barrier and then you actually had a wave that was approaching kind of like this these are your wave fronts and you know that the velocity of the wave is perpendicular to the wave front as always then actually what would end up happening is immediately after this gap it would only have well a little bit pass through but then it would start to spread out and if we we're being quantitative about it this angle would then define the amount of refraction and it's called the diffraction angle those are things that will be studied more next year but essentially this angle changes depending on the gap and the wavelength and so if you've got a something that you know has a small diffraction angle then it more or less just goes straight and doesn't really spread out but if you've got a large diffraction angle, then you can see that it's spreading out more compared to something that has a smaller diffraction angle. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the last one we'll talk about now is the concept that, you know, the superposition of a wave. So superposition simply means that the waves can coexist in the same location. So when waves pass each other, they don't disappear, they essentially occupy the same spot at the same time. And therefore what you observe is the result of both of those waves. Essentially, you add the waves together. And more technically, the amplitude of the waves. Well, the, the I suppose the displacements is probably more technically correct. So you're adding the displacements of the waves together to get the result. And this is now called interference. So you get an interference pattern. So think of a wave like a ghost, right? A ghost and another ghost, you know, unlike two people which can't take up the same spot at the same time, if the two ghosts pass each other, they can just be at the same place and they can kind of stack on each top of each other. And the more kind of ghosts you've got in the same location, they just, you know, they look more and more solid, right? You just add them all together. Yeah. yeah. But it's just, you're just putting them all in the same spot, right? Yeah. So basically superposition allows waves to take up the same spot at the same time, which means that if more than one wave ends up at the same spot at the same time, well, then they just add up together and you end up with what's called interference. And so superposition is talking about taking up the same spot at the same time. Interference is talking about the fact that they add together, which is what happens. So let's take a look at that. Yeah. So let's take a look at this. You've got a red wave, number one, and you've got a blue wave, number two. Now this red wave and blue wave are you know, moving both moving to the right. I can speed it up a bit more, but they're both moving to the right. But let's just take a snapshot in time and stop them. 
And now, what will end up happening is because they're in the same spot, so imagine they're in the same spot, basically, you're merging them. They're in the same spot. And you're trying to get them to figure out what ends up happening when they're at the same spot. Now, of course, you could, well, add them up together yourself, and we'll try and save a bit on time on that by getting the computer to do it for us. But you can see that, for example, look at particular spots like this. This is over here. This is zero and zero, so they won't really do much, right? You know, whereas somewhere like here, it's, you know, both together towards the top, so expected to kind of go a bit higher. And, you know, whereas somewhere like here, you're expecting it to kind of both go down, so you're expecting it to be a bit lower, right? Kind of thing, kind of idea. And so you can see that they don't match up perfectly, but you basically just take each and every spot and then just, you know, add them together. So I'll do one an example here. So you can see that in this spot, both red and blue are one and a half. So we end up expecting to have one and a half plus one and a half to give you three. And you know, we could add up somewhere like, for example, here. And you can see that blue is roughly, you know, one up or blue. And red, taking into account direction, is roughly two down. So this would be roughly minus one. And if you do that for each and every single point, then you'll get the result. And to save time, let's get the computer to do it for us. So the purple, so red plus blue gives you purple. So this purple is the result of the superposition of the red and the blue waves. You can see that, you know, this is about three, approximately. You can see that this is about minus one, as we said. And if you take a look at each and every single point here, you can, should be able to find that essentially purple is just one plus two of each and every single point. So if you're mathematically minded, think of, you know, number one as, you know, fx, number two as gx, and one plus two will just be your fx plus gx. You're literally just adding the functions together for all points. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I've put them together to hopefully make it easier to see. But um, of course, you don't have to put them together. And if you think of this as fx, right, and think of this as gx, then this really is just a sum, right? Yeah. Now, when you add them, certain things can happen. So you can see that when you add them, you might get a situation where, for example, they're both going up, like here. So when they're on the same side, we call that constructive interference. And that results in having an amplitude. So the resultant amplitude is bigger than the amplitude before. Right, because they added together. And that can go both up and down. So if, for example, somewhere like here would also be constructive. And you can quite clearly see that although the previous amplitudes were around, you know, two or so, this is closer to like, well, it's bigger than two, it's closer to four. On the other hand, somewhere like here, where this would be destructive interference. And the reason for that is quite simple. The red is going up, is above the axis, blue is down. So somewhere like here, as an example, that would be destructive interference. Because, well, they were in different directions. And because they're in different directions, what that then means, of course, is that the resultant amplitude 
is less than the original because they're working against each other. Yeah. So constructive, you know, is when you've got them adding at the same side, whether they're perfectly matched or not. Destructive is when they, you know, basically are not perfectly matched. And of course, you know, you could have perfect constructive interference like this. So you can see if I separate them out, one into a perfectly, um, you know, perfect match. So I guess this ends up just being double. Single point here is perfectly, you know, perfect constructive interference, but that doesn't have to be the case, right? We could also have perfect destructive interference where you can see that every single point perfectly cancels each other out. And you can see that basically your resultant wave is nothing. And that's how your, well, um, noise cancelling headphones try to work by cancelling out the waves. But any wave with any wave will always have an interference pattern, right? We can just change these things around. And if we change it around, you'll start to see, okay, well, they're both down. So these will be constructive interference. And here, one's up, one's down, and then this is destructive interference. And it's just that easy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. So the next thing we need to talk about essentially are standing waves, which we'll give you a diagram for in a moment. But, and will be a very, very important thing when we talk about that. But standing waves essentially are waves that appear to stand still and therefore not move in space. So they don't appear to be propagating. Now, this is actually an illusion, if you like, although we can think about it, them as standing waves and often do. They are usually the results, well, they're always the result of an interference pattern. But the interference pattern is usually from, you know, waves and the reflection of those waves. So basically, normally you'll have waves that are very similar, they'll have the same velocity um, and same wavelength. Um, and they, because they're traveling different directions, the interference pattern gives you a standing wave. So the result of an interference from waves and its reflections is the most common cause. So it's not actually a standing wave per se, although we do often say it, is, but think of it like that. It's a result of one wave going you know, forward and when we're coming back, and that gives us what we call, well, an interference pattern, which we call a standing wave. Yeah. So, what do standing waves look like? Well, let's take a look. So here, we're going to separate out the one and the two. You'll notice one and two, they're basically the same wave all the characteristics are the same, except one is going to the right and one is going to the left. So you, think, you can think of you know, red as going to the right and then after it hits some wall, it's bouncing back. So think of this as a rope, it hits the wall, so it gets bounced back in reverse. And so the blue is the reflected wave. Now a reflected wave is still a wave and it still travels, except this time it's going to the left. So therefore, if we get it to start moving, you can see that the red wave is going to the right, the blue wave is moving to the left, but if they are on the same rope, then they will superimpose and that will give us an interference pattern. Yeah. And of course we can you know, stop it and then draw it out <laughs> and then stop it and draw it out and then you know, stop it and draw it out and stop it and draw it out and so on. But let's just keep those things in mind, roughly there and roughly like that. And let's get the computer to do it for us to save us a bit of time. So in this sort of situation, the red wave is going to the right, the blue wave is going left, but they do interfere. And as you can see, they basically fully cancel each other out. This is basically full destructive interference. And if you move a bit more and get something like that, then they're more or less full constructive interference. 
and you move a bit more and you get something like this. Then the full destructive interference again. And you move a bit more and you do something like that. Then it's full constructive interference again. And then just letting it run for a bit. You can see that the purple way being the result of the interference pattern looks like it's a wave that's not really moving. It seems to be staying in place. And in fact, you've got places like here and here and here, which have particles that don't appear to be moving at all. And those have particular names. So standing wave is a new type of name. So these are what we call nodes. That makes it hard to see. Let me use black. So these are called nodes. The points that don't move are called nodes. Now I can clearly see that on the other hand, we've got places that, well, represent particles that move from the minimum to the maximum and they keep moving in between these spots. So these situation, these places that they are called antinodes. So these places that keep moving from maximum to minimum are called antinodes. So these yellow ones. So green equals nodes. The yellow are what are called antinodes, basically depending on if they move or not. Yeah. And those are basically what you've got for your standing wave. Now, if you've got a standing wave, and let's just stop it, say there, you can see that a standing wave actually still has a wavelength. So the wavelength is still the same sort of idea. So this is still a wavelength. And so you can see that the wavelength is basically a distance. So a distance between two nodes or antinodes for that matter for a standing wave is half a wavelength. So the distance between two nodes is the same as the distance between two antinodes and those would simply be half a wavelength for a standing wave. Okay. Yeah. Good. Now, a very key sort of important thing to sort of understand is the concept of resonance, when, especially when it comes to standing waves. So essentially, when it comes to standing waves, we need to talk about resonance. And resonance essentially refers to the fact that when you've got So resonance is basically when you've got um, the fact that each object has what's called a natural frequency. And those will basically depend on the sort of dimensions of the object and things like that. And those are things that we've kind of been talking about and we'll talk about in a moment with regards to your sort of standing waves in sound. So your open pipes, closed pipes and so forth. But each object has essentially a sort of natural frequency that matches the vibration of the object. <clears throat> now, if the supplied vibrations externally has a frequency that matches the natural frequency of the object, then essentially the waves then essentially add up. Essentially they constructively interfere. and add up, resulting in very large amplitudes, which therefore give very efficient energy transfers. <clears throat> 
And that could be a very good thing if you want to transfer energy across. So if you're trying to use microwaves to heat up food, we use 2.4 gigahertz because that's the sort of energy, um, that's the frequency that the water molecules will absorb. And therefore you get to try to transfer heat into the object, in this case, the food. So that's what we want to do in that case. But it could also be a very bad thing. For example, an earthquake. If an earthquake's frequency matches your building's resonant frequency, that's very bad news for your building. Your building is probably going to fall over if it's a big earthquake. Yeah. So that is essentially, and, and I think you study that in um, engineering as well. So that's sort of an important aspect of resonance that we need to sort of, you know, consider. So now we'll consider sound waves. Now remember the key thing with sound waves is that it is a longitudinal wave. So it therefore needs a medium. It's a longitudinal, which also makes it a mechanical wave. We normally want to describe how loud a sound is, and that is related to the amplitude. We are also sometimes concerned about how it sounds, in other words, its pitch, and that's related to its frequency. And it's basically the higher the amplitude, then the bigger the loudness. And the higher the frequency, then the higher the pitch. Okay. Now, because sound waves are longitudinal waves, they're usually hard to draw out. So often we study sound waves as transverse waves. And in that case, we would use the crest to represent a sort of compression and a trough to get your bra refraction. And the way we basically do this is we take our sound, we put it through a microphone. So your sound energy will be dumped through a microphone. And then your microphone will turn it into electrical energy, which you then put into the input of your cathode ray oscilloscope. And then you'll get a display. And in the cathode ray oscilloscope, this is time and this is displacement, or I suppose the voltage it's reading. And therefore it will read something like this perhaps in a very simple waveform. And that's how you study your sound waves. You give it a signal through a microphone. It's an actually electrical signal because it's passed through the microphone. And then you put it into the CRO and they can read off the graph. So the CRO is essentially giving you a displacement time graph. So you can read off the period. You can't read off the wavelength, but you can read off the period of a CRO. So, as with all waves, the intensity of a wave, because the wave spreads out in all directions, follows what's called the inverse square law. So the intensity of a wave is basically proportional to, or inversely proportional to the square of the distance. And as a result of that, if you've got I1 over I2 and you're comparing the two intensities, then that would basically be D2 over D1 all squared. But look, rather than focusing on the formula, just think of what that really means. What that basically means is if you double the distance, your intensity goes down by four times. If you triple the distance, the intensity goes down by nine times. Of course, if you reverse it, so if you half the distance, your intensity goes up by four times and so on. And so the key things you take away from this, I think, is that as your distance goes up, intensity goes down. Of course, as distance goes down, as you get closer, intensity goes up. 
and this is sort of common sense, right? The further away you are from a light, the dimmer it looks. The closer you are to a, to a light, even if it's not a very powerful light, if you put it right up next to your eye, it still seems pretty bright to you. Yeah. And just remember, it's not linear. It is proportional to the square. So every halving of the distance means that you've got a, you know, times four. Yeah. So sound waves, after all, they're still a wave. So sound waves can, of course, be reflected. And that's basically the same idea, right? It still follows all the laws. It still follows B equals F lambda and so on and so on. So if it gets reflected, then we consider it and sort of echo. And sometimes if you have a sound that's gone away and then comes back, then, you know, it might make the sound sound longer because firstly it's the sound you first heard and then the echo of that sound and the prolonging of that sound in terms of perception, that's called reverberation. Now, sound waves obviously also diffract. And that's basically how sound spreads out. That's why when you talk to some, like if you talk to someone face to face, the person standing next to them can also hear you because the sound wave is diffracted. In fact, if they stand behind you, they can probably still hear you because the sound wave is diffracting, right? Yeah. And the key thing to notice here is longer wavelength means more diffraction in general. Now, more importantly for your sort of topic here is probably the resonance that we talked about earlier. And this we said before is when the frequency of the force vibrations, so in other words, the frequency of external energy input must match the natural frequency of the object. Now, when it comes to sound, we need to investigate the standing waves essentially of them in strings. We will need to observe them in what's called closed pipes. And we need to also observe them in what's called open pipes. We'll do open pipes first and closed pipes. <coughs> and we're going to be talking about, you know, how they sort of work here. So if it's a string, basically your fundamentals frequency has a sort of wavelength like this. And importantly, that means for your fundamental or otherwise called the first harmonic must result in a frequency that is V1 over 2L. Yeah. And importantly, all harmonics are available. So basically, F2 must equal 2 times F1, etc. Okay. So for your fundamental frequency, uh, fundamental wavelength, lambda 1, because lambda 1 equals V1 over F1, that's basically just going to be 2L. And you can kind of see this happening, right? Because if this distance is L, then that's clearly half a frequency, right? A uh, half a wavelength. Yeah. And so in general, for lambda n, you're going to basically have a relationship where, if you like, L must equal n times lambda n over 2. The length of the string must be a whole number multiple of half of the wavelength. <laughs> and in general, we'll also find that, let me just move these up a bit. <clears throat> 
So, in general, we'll also find that the frequency Fn must equal n times F1. And that's the case for strings. You'll find that for open pipes, it's basically the same. So when it comes to open pipes, you pretty much end up with a very similar situation. So open pipes, you're going to have something like this and this, which means like that. And basically everything still follows. Your fundamental frequency F1 is still V1 over 2L and all your harmonics are still available and you still have the relationship L equals N times lambda N over two and F must equal N times F1. There's not really much difference there. The difference of course is not in the formulas, but in the fact that this is a string and this is a pipe and on a string, these are nodes and these here are anti-nodes, at least as far as displacement goes, right? So I guess whether the ends are nodes or anti-nodes are different, but that doesn't change the formulas in terms of working out the you know, fundamental frequencies and so on. Okay. Whereas for closed pipe, it is different. So remember what a closed pipe is. A closed pipe is when you're going to have a pipe, but one end is closed and one end is open, which then leaves you in a situation where this is an anti-node, but this end must be a node. And when you do that then, what you end up with is for your fundamental, something like this. But that means if you were to continue drawing this out and so on, you'll find that your fundamental frequency or your lambda one must equal four L and therefore your fundamental frequency is V over four lambda, uh, V over four L I mean. And so you can see that the formulas are now a little bit different. And because of the way that the closed pipe is sort of drawn out, and if you need a bit more detail, you can look at the closed pipe thing we've been talking about before it does not allow all harmonics. Only odd harmonics are allowed, are possible. So basically there is no, well, if you like the F2, if you like is three times F1. There's no two times F1. It doesn't, it's not stable. So we end up with a condition where L does not equal N times lambda N over two, but rather it's an odd, number 2n minus 1 is an odd number odd multiple it's 2n minus 1 which is odd times lambda over 4. Note that this must be odd and that would then mean of course that well your frequencies fn would also just be an odd multiple of f1 as well. So you can see closed pipes do indeed have different formulas and different situations. So the other things you need to know, of course, is the velocity of a wave on a string. So these can often be sort of tested together with your understanding of string resonances. And this is just a formula where V equals the square root of T over M over L. V is the velocity in meters per second. T is the tension of the string in Newton. M is the mass, L is the length in kilograms and meters, but it's probably more useful to think of it as M over L, which is mass per unit length. 
So basically, we're taking the tension and dividing it by how the mass per unit length of the string. That ratio is then square rooted to give us the velocity. Other things that we probably won't talk too much about today, but um, there are things we've talked about in the past is what's called the beat frequency. So remember the beat frequency is simply referring to the fact that when two waves of same velocity, but different frequency interfere, the new wave will have a, what's called a beat frequency where you'll see the wave amplitude go up and then down. So kind of like this, you can see that wave one and wave two, they've got a slightly different frequency. Um, and, you know, we could change it. So because vehicles F lambda, they've got the same velocity, but different frequencies. So that's why they land a slightly different, but the amplitude is the same. And you can see that their interference pattern ends up with sometimes a lower amplitude and sometimes a larger amplitude and then a lower amplitude and then a larger amplitude again and, and so on and it repeats. Which means that its amplitude is not constant but sometimes bigger and sometimes smaller, which we would be hearing as a louder sound and a softer sound. And that basically is calculated basically as the difference between these two frequencies. So basically the frequency of this new wave would be what's called the beat frequency, which is going to be 0 0.91 minus 0 0.75, which is going to be 0 0.16 hertz. So the relevant formula, therefore, is basically that the frequency of, or the beat frequency, is simply the absolute value of F2 minus F1. You also have what's called the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect is basically a result of when you have a, you know, source wave, source frequency of a wave is unchanged, but the source has relative motion to the observer. So the observer perceives, they think and feel and hear a different frequency. then the frequency here simply has a formula. All right. So the frequency here has a formula, which is the original frequency F times the velocity of the wave plus the velocity of the observer all over the velocity of the wave minus the velocity of the source. So that's the Doppler effect. Make sense? Yeah. Great. So the next thing we'll need to look at is essentially the ray model of light. And how it helps us sort of get images. <laughs> 